All right, now in Galatians chapter 5, I'm going to be preaching on the, the real famous part down here about talking about the fruit of the Spirit. And I want to point out, we've been, I've been kind of dealing with very similar subjects lately in my preaching. I just preached a sermon on the new man, which, which really helps to understand after you're saved, when you're born again, you have a new creature that's born inside of you. We still have this old flesh. So after a person gets saved, you're, you kind of have two parts to you. You've got your old man, your old sinful nature, this old flesh that we still are residing in in our bodies. But you also have that new spirit. And the new spirit is that new creature that's born from God. It's born from the word of God that takes root, that seed of God's word that takes root in your heart, that, that, that becomes a new creature through faith in Jesus Christ. When you get saved, you have that new spirit. And that spirit is what's going to guide you into all truth and all wisdom. When you're walking in the spirit, you're, you're obeying God, you're doing righteous things, and, and you're, you're going to be pleasing to God in his sight. And I preach an entire sermon about that, but this is, um, this is very related to that because now we're going to go into the fruits of the spirit. And it's important to note that, yes, it is possible, and I'm going to go into this a little bit more tonight in tonight's sermon, but look at verse 25 of Galatians 5. It says, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. It's possible to live in the Spirit because you're born again, because you have that new Spirit, but not to walk in the Spirit. We have that struggle. We have that battle, and it's something that we fight every day. As I, as I mentioned, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a war. It's a, it's a battle of the flesh versus the Spirit. Now, there's a lot of people out there who falsely claim that, well, if you're saved, then you're automatically just going to do good works and you're going to live righteously. And if you're sinning, then that's just proof that you're not saved. And that's just a false doctrine. And I'm going to I'm going to go into that. This, that's real heavy in lordship salvation is going to be preaching on tonight. But um, it's completely false. I'm going to disprove that from Scripture. But I want to focus more on the walking in the Spirit part this morning. We're going to focus on the, the good stuff this morning. It's, you know, last week was a really, really hard-hitting sermon um, for those of you that were here in the morning. And we're going to let up a little bit this week. We're going we're to go on much more pleasant subject of walking in the Spirit. We're going to see here... Um, one thing to note, the Bible says, and look at verse 16 of Galatians 5. He says, This I say, then walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. This is important to understand and note that if you're struggling with certain sins, if you have a sin in your life that you're really struggling with, you want to get rid of this, well, the Bible says that if you walk in the Spirit, you're not going to fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So the best advice I could offer if you, you know, if you are struggling with anything, you want to get yourself just doing the right things. A lot of times we tend to focus and, and really set our minds on that sin, whatever it is that, you, that you're struggling with. And, and it kind of consumes some of your attention. And, and rightfully so. You're thinking that, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. And maybe it's grieving you. You know, I've, I've got this sin. I want to get rid of it. But instead of just focusing on that one sin, I mean, you, want, you need to be able to identify it, obviously. But if it's something that's kind of plaguing you, instead of focusing on that sin, just focus on doing good things and just, just completely ignore whatever that sin may be, be and try to spend as much of your time as possible just doing righteous things. If you're walking in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And normally when sin creeps in, it's when you have a lull in your time. When you have time in your life, where you don't really have much to do. That's oftentimes when we find ourselves getting into trouble. And so I just have this free time, so what am I going to do? And you don't have a plan. You don't know what, how you're going to spend your day. Oftentimes then our, our flesh kind of speaks up and says, hey, I know what we can do. <laughs> and, and it's real easy to get caught up into things you don't want to do. So if you, if you spend your time, you know, it's, it's a lot harder for me. And, and I'm not going to, you know, I'm not lifting myself up in any way. But when you keep yourself really busy, I have a very busy schedule. I have an extremely busy schedule. I work a job. I'm pastoring a church. I've got my family. I've got all kinds of things going on. So I don't have breaks in my day where I'm just like, oh, what am I going to do today? You know, it's just, that just doesn't happen. And because of that, there's probably a lot of things that maybe where I would be finding myself getting into certain sins, I don't because 
man, I just got to keep going and going and going and going and going. And this is a similar thing, you know, if, if you're walking in the spirit, you know, if you find, say, hey, I've got time on Saturdays that are just free and I don't even know what to do. Go soul winning. Read your Bible. Study. Pray. I mean, there's, there's so many things that you can do that are pleasing in God's sight that will help you to be walking in the spirit and doing the right things. The other, the, 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 the lust of the flesh and those things will, will, you will not be walking in the lust of the flesh. You're not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh if you're doing that which is right. So the Bible lists off here in Galatians 5, lists off all kinds of sins that are the works of the flesh. Right? It says adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, all these different things, drunkenness, murders. These are all the works of the flesh. Now, like I mentioned earlier, we still have the flesh. So it is possible for a saved person, yes, to be a drunk or to be an idolater or to be an adulterer or to be a fornicator because that would just mean that they are fulfilling the lust of the flesh, which we still have. If our flesh was gone, then we won't have, when our flesh is gone, I should say, we won't have these things because this is the lust of the flesh that's drawing you into sin. But um, let's look at verse 22. We're going we're to focus more now on the fruit of the Spirit. I think I, I covered that amply. Let's look at verse 22. The Bible says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Now, I'm going to be going into a little bit more detail, not into all of these things, but we're going to, we're going to look at some of the aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. And this is something that we ought, you ought to experience. I mean, look, those are all great things. Think about that. Like, if you're living your life and you're experiencing love, and joy, and peace, right? Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Those are all great things. Those are all great fruits of the Spirit. That's, that's, the, that's what you receive. Those are the fruits that you get when you're walking in the Spirit. Now, um, now I'm not going to get into that now. The, you know, people want to talk about fruit saying that, like, well, if you... Th they'll find a time where you're angry at something, and they'll be like... Oh, well, you must not be saved because you're getting angry. You don't have the fruits of the Spirit. Again, maybe if you're getting angry without a cause, okay, you're sinning, but it doesn't mean that you're not saved. It just means you're not walking in the Spirit at that particular moment. You know, don't be like one of these people who want to just watch everything a person does and be like, oh, you've sinned. You must not be saved because that's, that's just completely false. But we're going to focus here. Let's look at some of these fruits of the Spirit because these are all good things. I mean, I think everyone would agree, yes, this is, these are things that I want to have in my life. I want to be experiencing love. I want to experience joy. I want to be happy. I mean, that's what the world is going to tell you that, you know, they want to be happy. But there's a difference between the world's joy and God's joy. Because God's joy is not deceitful. It's true happiness. The world's going to trick you and try to make you think, oh, hey, this will make you happy. And they'll say, you know, go ahead and drink that alcohol because it's going to make you feel good. Yeah, it's just a trick. Because you know, in the end, that alcohol, I mean, for one, it's going to leave you with a hangover and it's going to ruin and destroy your life. It's not going to do anything good for you. In the end, it's going to bite like a serpent and sting like an adder, the Bible says. And, you know, all kinds of things that the world tries to say, oh, you know, focus on you just being happy. They say, well, if you're not happy with your spouse, go find another one. Right? That's the world's idea of joy. Completely opposite from what the Bible teaches. We're going to see the joy. And that's one of the things we're going we're gonna to look into. That's like the first thing we're going to look into this morning. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 51. Because the joy that God can give you is, is greater than any other joy that you can receive through sin or through any other physical means in this world. God's joy is a joy that, that is true happiness and that doesn't go away. Um, Psalm 51, we're actually going to see here, this is a psalm of David when um, it says at the beginning of Psalm 51, it says when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone into Bathsheba. And this is David being very remorseful over his sin. Jump down to verse 10. He's, he's, you know, he's getting right with God. He's, he's repenting and he says in verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. 
Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. So notice he says, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Just being saved, there's a joy in that. There should be very extreme happiness. I remember my own personal salvation experience, if you want to call it that, when I decided to put my faith in Christ. It was at a very low point in my life. I was depressed. I had a lot of things going on. And I put my faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. That gave me joy. Just joy of knowing that I am never going to go to hell. That punishment is, has been wiped away by the blood of Jesus Christ. That, that is no longer going to happen. I am no longer going to see that place. I have nothing to do with hell. I am a child of God. That is a very, thing, a, a very good thing to be happy about. Now, notice, when David commit adultery with Bathsheba, when, that's one of the, the works of the flesh, right? He obviously was not walking in the Spirit. So because he was not walking in the Spirit, because he was fulfilling the lust of the flesh, he didn't have that fruit of the Spirit. He no longer had that joy. So when you get yourself into these sins, you stop walking in the Spirit. Well, hey, all those great things that we just mentioned, those are going to depart from you. Because you're not walking in the Spirit, you're not going to have the fruit of the Spirit. So that's why he says in verse 12, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Look, I want that joy again. I want to get right with you. I want to walk in the Spirit again. You know, and notice he also doesn't say, Restore unto me my salvation. Because David didn't lose his salvation by committing adultery. He just says, I want that joy back. He was already saved and he knew he was saved, but he needed that joy back of, that, that comes as a result of the fruit of the Spirit. And notice then he says in verse 13, Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Soul winning, Right? is one, way, one great way to be walking in the Spirit, doing what God wants you to do, preaching the gospel unto others, getting, other, getting sinners to be converted unto thee. That's what he's saying. You know, give me the joy of my salvation back. Help me to walk in the Spirit. When I'm walking in the Spirit, then I'm going to go out and I'm going to teach transgressors thy ways. I'm going to get back and, and do what's right in your eyes, God. And that's David's prayer unto God. Um <clears throat> On another, on another, no, another aspect of joy, um, the Bible mentions, and I've only got a few examples of a lot of these topics we're going to cover. The, the subject of even just joy in the Bible is huge. There's hundreds of times these words are found in the Bible, but oftentimes you'll see joy is, is associated with singing and singing psalms. You don't have to turn there, but turn if you would to Psalm uh, 126. That'll be the next place we're going. But Isaiah 52, 9, the Bible says, Break forth into joy. Sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem. And then in Isaiah 65, 14, the Bible says, Behold, my servant shall sing for joy of heart. One of the things that can help you just walk in the Spirit is songs. So singing godly songs, singing righteous hymns. There's a reason why we sing songs as part of our service. It's, it's, it's something that is, that is ordained of God. Um, the Bible says, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts unto God. God wants to hear our praises. God wants to be praised. But also, it, it helps you to get into the right spirit. It brings out the, you know, it helps you to walk in that spirit of God by singing the Psalms, by, by um, praising God's name. And singing is something that you normally associate with being joyful and being happy. And that's, that's definitely true in the Bible. And, and, you know, something that can help you out throughout your daily, just, just as you go out throughout your day, instead of singing the songs of this world and, and singing the rock songs and singing whatever's played on the radio, take one of these hymnals home with you. And yes, they're free. Everything in this church is free. Take one of these home with you. Learn some of these hymns. If you don't know them already, learn some of your, find your favorite songs, your favorite hymns, and learn them and just sing them throughout the day. That'll help you to keep walking in the Spirit so you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Think about that now. If you're, if you're thinking about a song, if you're, if you're someone like me, I love music. And you always just like, you love listening to music, you love singing music, you love everything about music. If you're singing and you have these songs running through your head that are the world's music, that are teaching you about, you know, 
adultery or fornication. Like, and that's what these, these songs are about. I'm not going to go into it. I've, I've done sermons on this in the past. But you know it's true. And if you don't think it's true, listen next time. If you're into the rock music or country or rap, or I don't care what genre you listen to. Whatever it is, listen to the things that they're saying and you'll find out that they're sinful. They're wicked. They're not godly. They're not good things that are being taught and being sung. And um, these aren't the thoughts that you want to have over and over running through your mind. That is going to drive you into more sin. I've noticed this personally in my own life. I really love music, as I mentioned earlier. It's something that's really just, just stirs up my spirit and my soul. And it feels good to the flesh. You know, the rock music, all of it. I listen to just about every genre of music. And I noticed that the more I listen to music, the more I would get into other sins. It's a mindset. It's, it's a subtlety. The, the message that's being transmitted to you through that music is very subtle. And it gets in your mind almost subconsciously you don't really think about it that much oftentimes I would find myself singing along the songs and it would be years of songs I'd already known before I ever even put a thought to what is that really actually saying because you just you just get caught up in the music and and you hear it and you learn the words but you don't ever really think about it and that's how I was and I don't know maybe you're different but that's how I was there would be songs and I'd be like wait that song saying that like you can't even believe it but you already like the song so much that you don't, you don't stop listening to it. You just say, yeah, well, I don't really like what it's saying, but I kind of like the song anyways. When you let yourself get into it and, and music becomes that part of your life, it will lead you into more sin. But if you don't want to fulfill those lusts of the flesh, get the right music in you. Listen to the, you know, sing hymns and praises unto God. If that's in your heart and if that's what's in your mind, it's going to naturally follow that you're going to be walking in that spirit because this is where you'll be spiritually minded. You'll be thinking about God. You're not going to be trying to forget about God because I want to do this sin. You're going to have God at the forefront of your mind. This will help you and it'll also bring you joy. I get lots of, I love singing the hymns. It's, it's, it's a joy of heart to me to be able to sing these and, and hopefully it will be to you too. Um, but if you, if you still have that, the, the worldly music, you know, I've, I, cut that out it might hurt it might be painful just just get rid of it you don't need to listen to something on the radio all the time turn that off and and i promise you it will it will impact your life in a positive way to get that music out of your life um it will it will help you to not succumb to the lust of the flesh so you're in psalm 126 let's look at verse number five we're talking about joy, right? Walking in the Spirit. Psalm 126 verse 5 says, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Anyone who's gone out and preached the gospel to the lost and actually has been participant to somebody receiving Christ as their Savior will know that that is a very joyful event. Now, you may go in tears. It may be hard. You might, you know, you might be struggling. You might be tired. You might be weary in going out and, and putting in time and knocking on doors. You might be fearful a little bit. You, know, you ought not to be, because you know, the Bible says that, the, that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a, of a sound mind. If we're walking in the spirit, you know, God is going to give you boldness. And you notice all the times when the Holy Ghost comes upon the apostles and it comes upon people in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, when, when God's spirit comes upon somebody, they are always bold to speak God's word. They're never afraid. They're never saying, oh man, I wonder what, what, what's going to happen to me now. Every time without fail, when God's Spirit comes upon some, uh, somebody, they're bold to speak. So we ought to be bold and pray for God. If you, don't, if you don't have that boldness in your life now, pray that God will give you that boldness. But regardless, it's important that we go out and we bear that precious seed, bear the seed of God's Word and bring it to the lost. He says that they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. And it truly is a joyful experience to, to get another person saved, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ unto them and to persuade them and to get them converted to trusting in Christ alone as their personal Savior. When somebody does that, when you can show them and show them everything in the Bible that Jesus did for them, explain the free gift, and they, they convert their heart and trust on Christ alone, amen, that is so joyful. And, and if you've never done that before, you might, you, you're not going to understand it. 
But it is, it, you, you have to take it by faith now and hopefully it doesn't, you, you'll be able to learn for yourself later um, that it truly is a joyful experience. I've, got, I've gone out soul winning in some really rotten moods before where, you know, whatever is going on at home or at work and just, you know, you're frustrated, things are going on. But I'll tell you what, all of that fades. All of that goes away the minute I start talking to someone at the door or wherever. Doesn't have to be at the door. Anytime you you you, you whip out the Bible and you, you hey, can I show you? Can I show you how to be saved? Do you know for sure you're going to heaven when you die? All of a sudden, all of the cares, all of the stress, everything else that you might have been dealing with, it goes away, and and it's a joyful experience. You don't have to turn there. Turn if you would to um, go to. Your, we're in Psalms. Just flip over to Proverbs. This is the next book. Proverbs chapter 12. I'll read from you from 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 19. The Bible says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our jo glory and joy. And he's talking about people who have been converted unto Christ. They are your glory. They are your joy. They're going to be there at Christ's return. They're going to be with you. Think about every soul that you lead to Christ. That is something of eternal value. That is somebody, that is a person that you are going to see for sure later on. If that person believes on Christ, they have everlasting life. Even if you never saw them again in this world, in this lifetime, you will see them again. That has eternal value. That is something that is very joyful. Proverbs 12, look at verse number 20. Moving on. The Bible says, Deceit is in the heart of them that imagine evil, but to the counselors of peace... Is joy. So this is talking about um, a counselor, someone that that gives advice, right? Someone, and it's and it's contrasting deceit with a counselor of peace, someone who's who's going to speak um, good advice, be a good counselor, bring peace. Hey, that's gonna that's gonna bring joy. Ecclesiastes two twenty six says, "For God giveth to a man that is good in his sight." Wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner he giveth travail to gather and to heap up that he may give to him that is good before God. This also is vanity and vexation of spirits. So what he's saying is that God giveth, gives to a man that's good in his sight. So how are you a man that's good in God's sight? By obeying him, by following him. Obviously it starts with being saved, but um, when you're walking in the spirit, he says you're gonna give you, he's going to give you wisdom and knowledge and joy. God's going to give you that joy if you're pleasing in his sight. And just like any child, and I love this illustration, I bring it up in so many of my sermons, but it's an important point to drive home. When you're saved, when you're born again, you become a child of God, right? And it's a very simple concept to understand. Once you're his child, we have a choice. We could either be a good child or a bad child. Are we going to listen to what he says? Are we going to hear him? Are we going to say, okay, God, I heard you told me not to do this, so I'm going to respect you, I'm going to obey you, and I'm not going to do it. That's what a good child does. A bad child's going to say, I know this is wrong. I know, I know my father told me not to do this, but I'm going to do it anyways. Now, take that example. I mean, that's, that's with God, with, with your own family. I think with my, with my children. How joyful do you think my children are going to be when they just disobey everything I tell them to do? They're not going to be very happy. They may be happy for a moment if whatever it is that, that they're doing is something that they think is going to make them happy. Because even though I told them not to, you know, I said, no, no sweets, you know, no, you, you can't have any ice cream. And they're like, oh, but I love ice cream. It's going to make me happy. And they go and do it anyways. That joy is going gonna, is gonna to be very short-lived. I guarantee you that. When my children disobey me, it's not going to be joyful. Be why? Because they're going to get a punishment. They're going to be disciplined. They're going to be shown, and oh, that's wrong. You can't do that. You need to listen to dad. You need to respect dad. You need to obey. And it's the same way with God. When we decide to disobey him, when we're walking in the flesh, we're not walking in the spirit, we're doing things against what he says, well, we're not going to be joyful. It's not going to be a pleasant experience. Our relationship with God is going to be strained. He's going to be angry with us, and we're going to feel the result of that in our life. We're not going to have the proper joy. But on the other hand, if we're doing what's right, if we say, you know what, God, I see that, that you say in the Bible, I'm not supposed to do this, so I'm not going to do it. I'm going to respect you. I, 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 
understand that you know way more than I do. You know what's best for me. I'm just going to trust you and, and obey you. God's going to bless you for that. And one of the blessings is joy. It's, a, it's that fruit of the Spirit that you're going to receive. These are all great things. These are all good things that are given to us by God. That joy. Um, let's see. I'll move on to the next point. I've got one more scripture here. But let's, let's go on to peace. Peace is another fruit of the Spirit. So we're in Proverbs. right? To flip back to Psalm 4. Psalm 4. Psalm 119, 165 says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Loving God's law. And again, people will often criticize fundamental Baptists by saying, oh, you're such legalists, right? Oh, why are you always preaching on God's law? Why are you always preaching about sin and God's law? Don't you know that we're free from God's law because we're under grace through Jesus Christ? Well, yeah, for being saved, we're free from the curse of God's law. But the Bible still says here that great peace have they which love thy law. This is Psalm 119 that hasn't just been done away with. That Psalm is not meaningless. It definitely has just as much meaning today as it ever has. To have great peace because you love God's law. You're in Psalm 4. Look at verse number 8. He says, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. Trusting, having that faith in God, knowing that safety is of the Lord can give you peace. God is the one who's able to make us safe. You may not have you may not own a gun. You may not have a security system in your house. You may not have all these other things to, to make you feel secure and safe. But if you have your faith in God and you trust in God, that can give you the, the perfect peace that you have. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong or, or there's any problem with doing those other things or, or that it, it shows a lack of faith even. I, I don't believe that. I think it's prudent to, to have measures to keep yourself safe. But ultimately, no matter how much, I don't care how much of that stuff you have, if God is not protecting you, then thieves are going to be able to break through and steal. Bad people are going to be able to get to you no matter how many levels of protection you think you have. If God is not with you, if God is not there to protect you, nothing can keep you safe ultimately. You can't trust in the physical aspects. We need to trust in the Lord. God will give us that perfect peace, that peace of mind, that peace of heart to know that, hey, I'm doing right. If something bad happens to me, it must be in God's will, right? So you can look at, I've used this example in the past as well, Stephen, who is martyred for Jesus Christ. Bad, so that's something bad that happened to him. He got stoned with stones, right? Very unpleasant. Not something that, that you look forward to. Not something that you're thinking like, oh, wow, this is great. I'm glad this is happening to me. But it was a good thing because it was God's will that he got martyred. He gave his life for the cause of Christ, and that was something that, that actually is a, is a true blessing. And in that moment, the Apostle Paul was there. He was named Saul then. But that event must have had a huge impact on Saul's conversion. Right? Mm -hmm. Stephen was doing what was right. He was walking in God's will. He, he was filled with the Spirit. The Bible says he was preaching and they could not, they were confounded by his wisdom and by his Spirit. They, they couldn't say anything against him because he was just speaking the truth. And they got so angry at him that they stopped their ears and they ran on him and they stoned him with stones and killed him. He was doing everything right, definitely in that moment. He was walking in the Spirit. He was doing right by God. God allowed him to be martyred. But he was doing that which was right. And he had peace. And it's evident he had peace. Because he says, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. He even had enough peace and enough compassion to just say, you know, don't, don't hold them guilty. That, they're killing me, God, but they don't know what they're doing. Don't lay this into their charge. That is great love. That is great peace. That is great joy. All these things, all these fruits of the Spirit, you can see were, were evident in that moment with Stephen, in a moment where you would think that he'd have none of those things because he's getting rocks pelted at him, right? Yet he did because he was walking in the Spirit. He, he had that great 
peace. And this is something that, that we can have also. We want to strive to be walking the Spirit as much as possible. If you have turmoil in your life, you have inner turmoil, if you have a lot of stress, hey, God will give you that peace. Walk in the Spirit. Walk in His ways and you will get that peace. Um, flip, if you would, to Philippians chapter 4. Turn, if you would, to Philippians chapter 4. I'll read for you from Romans 8. Romans 8, 6 says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Romans 10, 15 says, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. The gospel that we preach is a gospel of peace. You have peace through Christ Peace that you no longer have to have that punishment to pay. You are not going to be held liable for your sins in an eternal burning fiery furnace. If you're in Philippians chapter 4, look at verse number 6. Philippians 4, 6 reads, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on, those, on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. So again, this is, this is just another way of stating to walk in the Spirit. Uh, in, in verse 8, when he says, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report, if there's any virtue, you to think on those things. Keep your mind focused on those things so you can be walking in the Spirit so that the God of peace will be with you. And the, the peace of God, says, which passeth all understanding, you can't even understand the peace of God. It's just something that, that you can experience. He says, It shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And that is a great thing to have. Now, peace is a very good thing. Unfortunately, in our culture, in, in the American culture at least, oftentimes you can, you can hear the word peace and it's associated with the hippies, right? With people who are just like free love and, and peace, man, and all this stuff. And it, it kind of gives you this impression of someone who's a sissy and someone who's just a pushover and just, just you know, and that's, that would be someone who's just like peace at all costs. But that's not what the Bible teaches either. The peace we've been looking at is kind of more of like an inner peace, a peace that you find, you know, you get in your heart and in your mind. But it's also, it's not just an inner peace. We ought to try to, to live at peace with the people around us. War is not something to be desired ever. Unfortunately, it is necessary sometimes, and, and the Bible talks about that, and, and you know, Jesus even admonished his disciples to make sure that they had a sword. And, and you know, there's, there's a reason for having some of these things. But we want as much as possible. The Bible says in Romans 12, I'll quote this for you, he says, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. So God wants us to live peaceably with all men. He, he wants us, as much as is possible, we want to, to strive to have this type of a peace. Now, as I said, though, unfortunately, in our, in our culture, you know, that, that peace is associated with maybe being weak when it doesn't have to be. Um, where did, are you still in Philippians 4? Did I have you turn anywhere else? Philippians 4. Turn, if you would, to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Because this is where I'm going to read next. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, we'll be looking at verse 14. 2 Thessalonians 3, 14 says, And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. Now, the reason why we're reading this is there's sometimes attaining peace 
is done by, by making sure you're not having company with even a brother in Christ who is, who is committing some pretty bad sins. The Bible talks about some, you know, a brother who is a, a fornicator, an idolater, or covetous, you know, with such an one, no not to eat. So there's certain sins that the Bible calls out that's saying, look, if there's someone that's called a brother, someone who's saved, someone who's been in church for a while, someone who knows better, someone who understands and they've grown and they know, and, and they're getting into these other sins and they're an extortioner or a drunkard, don't eat with that person. Now, there's, a, there's multiple reasons for that. So it says here in verse 15, yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. For one, that's going to help that person out. That's a loving thing to do for a brother in Christ is, is, is to separate from them. Because there comes a point where people just need to understand, hey, what I'm doing is wrong and it's going to have some consequences and that's going to mean I'm going to be kind of shut out from being able to even fellowship with my friends. Because... I've got this in and I've got to get this in right. And it's kind of a tough love type of a stance to say, you know what? We don't, you know, we have to make a line in the sand and God draws that line for us and says, you know, anybody getting involved in this, you, you, we're not going to fellowship with you. Now we're going to love you. You're a brother, but you need to change this. This is something that you need to get right in your life. And he said, that's why you don't count him as an enemy. But at the same time, you're not going to be spending your time with that person and eating it with them. Now, what that's going to produce, though, for one, a little, the Bible says a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. You don't want to have that person that's involved in that sin kind of bringing that sin around everyone else and infecting other people. Because what it's going to do, when that's just accepted, when that's accepted in church, when that's accepted among the brethren that someone can just do some pretty bad sins and just, just say, well, it's just fine. That teaches other people. That's going to teach the children. That's going to teach maybe some weaker Christians to say, oh, well, I guess it's not a big deal then. Right? I mean, this person's a drunk. Brother so-and-so, yeah, he's a drunk, but no one seems to care. No one does anything about it. No one says anything about it. It must not be that bad. And you can see how that, I mean, the kids will see that. The a weaker Christian's going to see that. But God says, No. You know, that, it's not acceptable. It's not okay. We live, we're supposed to live according to at least a certain standard. We're not going to be just fornicating and getting drunk and doing these other things. Being an extortioner. I mean, come on. This is, and we're not talking about like daily sins that you might commit in your life. These are some pretty big deals. He's saying, you know what? No, that person's got to go. And if they're a brother, you know, you're going to go. It's going to bring peace among, among the rest of us. It's going to bring unity and peace among the rest of the brethren. But they're going to have to get that right. And then when they get that right, they come back in. We welcome them with, with open arms and, and love them and bring them back in and be forgiving just as Jesus Christ is forgiving for our sakes. But they need to get that right, um, whoever it is. It doesn't matter who that person is. If they're a brother, if they're, if they're considered a brother, not just some brand new Christian that just got saved yesterday, but someone who's you know, considered a brother, um, we need to not count them as an enemy. And the Lord of peace is going to give us peace by all means. And sometimes that means it's going to have to be by, by letting someone know that they're, they're not welcome to fellowship because they are in a grievous sin. Now, um, let's go on to long-suffering. We're almost done here. I'm not going to, like I said, I'm not going to go through all of the fruits of the Spirit because each one of these can pretty much be a sermon in and of themselves. Joy, peace, um, faith, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, all those things are, are, are great subjects. We're going to look at long-suffering now. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4. One last point, though, on peace. So before, I, before I move on from that, forgiveness is going to bring peace. So in our lives, it's, you know, we want to be at peace with others. We want to have that through the Spirit. Well, we need to be Christ-minded also and be able to forgive people for their faults. When you hold a grudge against someone, that's going to cause more of a strife and that is not going to be at peace with people. You know, when, you, when you are holding grudges and you have problems with other people, that's going to continue whatever the problem is between you and that person. We need to be able to, to be humble have a, a humble mind and a humble attitude that says, you know what, even though this person has done me wrong over and over again, 
I'm going to try to to have my mind as much as possible like Jesus Christ's mind in being able to forgive. Anytime you have a problem with someone else and you just have this problem and you say, I don't want to let this go, I can't forgive that person. Think about your own sins in your life. Go back in your mind and start to recall all of the sins that you've committed in your life. All the wrongs that you've done to other people. All the wrongs that you've just done to God. And then think, God forgave me of every single one of those sins. Every single one of them. The Bible says as far as the east is from the west, we are separated from our sin. He's not going to mention them to us again. He forgives and he forgets. They're gone. Gone forever. Those sins are gone. Yet you're going to hold a grudge against somebody? See, God gives us that peace because he's able to forgive us. God can be at peace with us because he forgives us of our sins. And he doesn't think about them again. They're gone. They're done. We need to be able to have that same attitude with other people that do us wrong. We need to be able to forgive them. We need to be able to, to, to not have that vengeance. And I, and I quoted um, Romans 12, 18. It says, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. That, that passage continues, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. When someone's doing you wrong and you can forgive them, do good, do not even just forgive them, do good unto them, is what the Bible says. Now look, because it's not our place to, to revenge ourselves. We can take peace and comfort knowing that God sees all these things. So when you have the proper attitude and you can be, you know, for one, trying to be peaceful with someone else and trying to extinguish any, any strife that may exist between you, not only can you try to attain peace that way, but you can also just have the peace of mind even if that person won't let it go. And they just continue to be your enemy and continue to do bad things. You say, okay, you know what? I'm just going to do what's nice. God's going to see what's going on here. God could see my heart. God could see I'm doing what's right. I'm doing what he told me to do. He'll avenge me because God is a just God. He'll, he'll see what's going on. And we could have peace and satisfaction that knowing that, I mean, who else would you want to have responsible for making sure that wrongs are corrected other than God? I mean, God's perfect. God is a just God. And he'll know exactly what needs to be done to handle the situation more than you know, more than I know. We just do our part and try to live in peace and God will take care of the rest. And that is a great comfort and peace that we can have within ourselves. Long suffering. Where did I have you turn to? Ephesians 4. Let's look at verse number 1. Ephesians 4 verse 1. The Bible reads, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Peace and long-suffering go hand in hand. Long-suffering is just where you're, and that's why we started with verse, in verse 2 there, it says, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. Long-suffering is forbearing. A lot of things happen to you, you could be long-suffering. It means you're, you're suffering something to happen, you're allowing things to happen and, and, and for a long period of time without you getting angry, without you getting upset, where, where people can sin against you and... It happens and happens. And, you know, with children is a great example. We need to be long-suffering with our children because they're not perfect. You can't demand perfection out of your children. Now, you may have rules and, and laws for them to follow and stuff. And, and, yeah, of course, they need to obey them. But, you know, every single slight or every single mishap, they don't need to have that heavy hand coming down on them. We as parents need to be long-suffering with them. Say, okay, I know they're, you know, they're, they're, they're going to make mistakes. They're not perfect. They're going to do things that are wrong. It doesn't mean they don't ever get punished or disciplined. They, they need the discipline just as much. They need, they need that as well. But we need to remember the long-suffering. It's the same way with, with people. We need to be long-suffering with those that sin against us, and we'll have that peace. Um, we're going to jump down to verse 17 there. I'm going to read for a couple of, from a couple other places. Colossians 3.12 says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Notice, in both of those uh, verses that we just read, 
there's this humility and meek attitude and spirit that we need to have in, a, in us in order to be long-suffering and in order to live at peace with people. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. That's the type of attitude, that's the mindset we need to have to be walking in the spirit and to, and to have these, the fruit of the Spirit as a result. 2 Timothy 4, 2 says, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. And this was to Timothy, a preacher um, by Paul, telling him that he needs to preach the word. You need to be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, that's telling someone they're wrong. Rebuke, that's telling someone that they're wrong. And exhort is, is building someone up with all long-suffering and doctrine. So the preacher with the church also needs to have long suffering. You know, people aren't going to change usually just overnight. It, oftentimes our growth is going to be a little bit more gradual. That, that there's sins in our life that just because you hear something once doesn't mean you're automatically just going to be, that's gone. I mean, no one's like that. Otherwise, we'd be perfect by now, right? But um, we need to understand that too. And this can go for your spouse. This can go for a close family member or whatever, you know, You'd be like, man, I don't know why. You know, I told them, I showed them from the Bible, you know, and they're still doing this thing. Well, have some long suffering for that person, and and continue. Don't give up, but be long suffering with it, and, and and say, okay, well, this might just take some time, because that's how often we are as well. Ephesians four. Let's let's jump back there. We're gonna kind of finish off in Ephesians. We're going to read a lot of scripture, Ephesians 4 and then going into 5. This is going to sum it up and then we're done. This is an admonition for us to walk in the Spirit. And if you're saved, it's time that you start walking in the Spirit. If you haven't been already, you need, we need to make sure, look, it's, it's great that you're saved. Amen. You're going to go to heaven when you die. But that's not the whole purpose of us being here. It's not just to get saved. We need to be walking in the Spirit. We need to be doing that which is right. That is really our purpose. We need to be reaching other people. We need to be bringing the gospel of Christ to others. That is our goal. That is our mission. That is our purpose for being here. It's not all just about us getting saved. It's actually the opposite. It's about others. And this is an admonishment that we get in Ephesians 4. We're going to start in verse 17. The Bible reads, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. So he's, he's drawing a distinction here, right? There's, look, this is how the world acts. You are, you know, as other, in this he's talking to Gentiles, to Ephesians, you know, don't walk as the other Ephesians do. Don't walk as the other Gentiles. You know, they're walking in the lust of the flesh, and but you have not so learned Christ. You know, that is no longer for you to be living that way. If you're saying it's, you, you need to come out of the world. You need to live righteously. We have not so learned Christ. Verse 21, If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that ye put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor for we are members one of another. So the first thing he mentions here about walking in a new man is don't be a liar. Speak the truth. And where does the truth come from? The truth comes from God's word. But we ought not to just be lying in general. I mean, if you, if you have a habit of lying in your life, get rid of that habit. We need to just be truthful. You need to have a good testimony of if someone could say, oh yeah, this is a Christian. Yeah, but they're lying all the time. You know, they're always telling something that's untrue. That is a horrible witness and it brings a bad testimony and, and bad reflection onto God and on Jesus Christ when that, if that's what you're known for. He says, put away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor. We're members one of another. Verse 26. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. So here we see a verse very clearly saying, be angry. He says, be ye angry, but sin not. So it's not a sin in and of itself just to be angry. Being angry is not a sin. There's specific situations where it is or is not a sin. 
But just being angry, Jesus Christ was angry when he went into the temple and he saw the, the people buying and selling the doves and, and he flipped over the tables of the money changers. He was angry when he did that. But it was a righteous anger. Jesus did not sin one time. So just being angry in and of itself is not wrong. But he's saying here at the same point though, if you're angry, don't sin. Because it's very easy for you to slip into sin when you get angry. And sometimes just being angry at, at a certain you know, being angry with a brother without a cause, that is a sin. So there are times when getting angry is a sin. You shouldn't get angry with someone for no reason. If there is this, if it's just causeless and you just get angry with somebody, that is not that is not acceptable. That is a sin. But um, let's say you have a righteous anger. He says, be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your earth. So it's not something that you need to, it's not something that God wants you to keep inside and to keep festering and to stay angry. Jesus Christ, I guarantee you, after he took care of that problem, he moved on. He did not let that bug him and bother him. Oh man, I can't believe they were doing that. And they were doing that in the temple. He just stayed angry and then woke up the next day angry. There's no way to, that's why he says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So you get angry in the daytime, he's saying, okay, by the time the sun's going down, you shouldn't still have that wrath. You shouldn't still be angry. You should be able to let that go. Deal with it appropriately, whatever that may be, and move on. Don't let that anger fester because that anger is going to cause bitterness. And you don't want to have bitterness in your soul. Um, Let's keep reading here. Anyways, these are ways to help us to, to, to walk in the newness of our spirit, right? Walking in the new man. So that we saw putting away lying, not being angry, you know, not letting the sun go down upon our wrath. Verse 28, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good that he may give, that, that he may have to give to him that need it. So instead of stealing, you ought to be able to, to work Provide for yourself and have enough then to be able to give to other people. It's the exact opposite of stealing, right? You're, you're doing the exact opposite of, of walking in the flesh when you're walking in the spirit. Um, instead of stealing, you're giving. Verse 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. The way that we speak is very important. We need to watch our tongues. And this is something that is very easy for us to fall into because the, the Bible says that the, the, the tongue is a, is a fire, it's a world of iniquity. In James it says that. And um, we need to watch what we say that the things that we say should be good to the use of edifying. What is edifying? It's building somebody up. It's, it's to benefit somebody else, the things that are coming out of your mouth. So you shouldn't be saying things that are just going to be dragging people down. That's the opposite of edifying. When you're, when you're slandering, or even if you're saying something that's true and you're just bringing somebody down, think about what is the point of you doing that? What is your goal? What is your intent to speak bad and speak evil about somebody else? Again, even if it's true, what is, your, what is the objective? Are you just trying to tear that person down just to make you feel better or because they've wronged you? If you're walking in the Spirit, you should have the peace and, and the long-suffering and, and the, the, be able to, the forgiveness to be able to forgive someone for doing that to you and not have to use your mouth to, to, to bring that person down. We need to use that which is good to the edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Verse 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Again, just a great proof that once you're saved, you're sealed. You're sealed all the way until the day of redemption. The day of redemption is when you get that new body, when Jesus Christ comes back. We are sealed all the way until then. Nothing can break that seal. When God seals you with that Holy Spirit of promise, you are His. Amen. Verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. It's all so wrapped up there, walking in the spirit with, with having the humbleness, having that humility, having that forgiveness. As, and that's why he even mentioned it here as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. We need to keep that in our mind all the time, what Christ has, did, has done for us so that we don't get ourselves lifted up too much into thinking that, oh, well, I can't believe they did that to me. You know, how could you possibly do that to me? How dare you do that to me? And have that type of attitude. Now, again, I'm not saying that, that someone didn't wrong you. 
And that they shouldn't do those things, of course, but the way that we respond, the way that we react to those things, if we're walking in the Spirit, we have to be tender-hearted not to have this wrath and anger and evil speaking. He says, put that away from you. That's not the way, I, that's not the way you're going to be walking in the Spirit. This is how you need to walk in the Spirit. Let's continue on to chapter 5 because, you know, when the Bible was originally written down, it wasn't broken up into chapters. I don't have any problems with the chapter breaking up. It's, it's a great way of referencing things. But this is all still part of the same thought in Ephesians 5 from Ephesians 4. We're going to keep reading here. We're finishing up with this. We're almost done. Ephesians 5 1 says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know that no whoremonger nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Now, I want to pause right there because I, I want to make sure I'm clear about this point. I'm not sure if I was. We need to be forgiving. We need to be long-suffering. We need not to be high-minded. All very important. But we also need to be able to reprove the darkness. We need to be able to prove sin and reprove evil. So being long-suffering doesn't mean you don't respond. It means you don't, you don't get angry about it. You don't have to take matters in your own hands and get vengeance or be bitter against somebody else. But it also doesn't mean that you don't say anything. Okay? We still need to reprove the unfruitful works of darkness. There's nothing wrong with telling, if someone sins against you, there's nothing wrong with reproving that person and telling them, hey, you're wrong. You shouldn't be doing this. Now, the way you do it, you know, you don't have to get angry. You don't have to, you don't have to, um, to have bitterness. You know, all, the, all these things that we already mentioned, you don't have to bring that person down, but you can tell them that they're wrong and, you, and we can rebuke and reprove sin and, and we're, we're supposed to do that and we're supposed to live separate. But, um, you know, I just want to I want to mention that because the Bible even says right here it says have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Um, it says in verse twelve, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. So then they that excuse me see then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in fear of God. And that's what I, was, what I was getting at earlier, to be filled with the Spirit. Verse 18, be not drunk with wine where is in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. How will we be filled with, this, with the Spirit? Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. It's going to help you to be filled with the Spirit. Singing the songs is going to bring joy. It's going to bring the peace. It will help you to walk in the Spirit. You're going to be righteously minded, thinking about God, doing the right things. And um, I'll wrap it up with this. You don't have to turn there, but in Philippians 1 is the last point. It's a, I'm just Basically, some of the common results that I found in studying this out and of walking in the Spirit should produce unity of faith, soul winning, going out, reaching the lost, having boldness to speak, and also having a humble spirit. 
humble addresses all the long suffering and the peace and the, and, and the forgiveness and all that. You need to have humility for that. All of these are, will come as a result of walking in the Spirit. Philippians 1.27 says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation that of God. He says that we stand fast in one spirit. There's our unity. And in our church, we ought to be unified in one spirit, in the spirit of God, in the spirit of truth from his word. With one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Our goal, our mission as a church is to, to work together, to strive together for the faith of the gospel, to bring the gospel to other people. That is our main focus. That is our unifying goal as a church is to bring the gospel of peace to the lost. And he says, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries. We don't need to be afraid of the enemy. We have that peace from God. All of these things are going to be a result of walking in the Spirit. And we all need to be walking in the Spirit together to be unified, to preach the gospel, and to not be afraid of what the world thinks, what the world says, what the enemy is going to try to do to us. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. God, I pray that you would please help us all to walk in the Spirit. God, I know it's one of my regular prayers to you is that you would help me to walk in the Spirit. Lord, there's, there's a lot we learned today, a lot of scripture we went over from singing songs and the way that we ought to deal with people. God, I pray that you please help us to have a humble mind, humble hearts, dear Lord. Help us to never be um, forgetful of our, of our own sinful lives that you have forgiven. Lord, help us to be um, forgiving unto others. God, I pray that you please help us to live at peace and um, that you would give us all of those fruits of the Spirit when we, um, and that we would walk in them as much as possible every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.